Alrighty folks, and welcome to the Chronicler Podcast channel. Episode 2, Chinese Society's Mythological Origins, or the period of the Five Sage Kings. Now in my introductory podcast, I mentioned that China's history is around 5,000 years old, and it is the oldest civilization on the planet today. Now China today has a population of 1.4 billion people, 56 provinces which range from the deserts in the west, lush grasslands and jungles in the south, and huge grasslands in the north. The dominant group of China is the Han, but they are not the only group. There are 55 different ethnicities in China as a whole. So how did we get to the China that we know today? Well, it all starts here, around the two great rivers, the Yellow River in the north and the Yangtze River in the south. Cultures did spring up around these rivers around 5,000 years ago, and probably before that too. Now today, we are going to focus on the Yellow River. Now, I'm going to remind you here that the following story is all pure myth. There is absolutely no archaeological evidence, and the only primary sources that we have come from around 2,000 years later. So yeah, let's bear with it just now, and I'll let you decide if you like the story or not, because this is all that it is. It's just a story until proven otherwise. So, our story will start with a man named Xuan Yuan, and I'll say that one more time, Xuan Yuan, and he is also known as Huang Di, or the Yellow Emperor translated. Now, for the purpose of this show, I will stick with Huang Di, because it's the easiest name to remember. So Huang Di's reign began at around 2697 BC. Now Huang Di is a cultural icon and hero today. He is credited with uh, creating the Chinese calendar based on lunar cycles, which are still celebrated today. Just think of the Chinese New Year, it's based on a lunar calendar. He's also credited with teaching his nomadic peoples to build shelters. He's also credited with learning astronomy and sound laws of state. Even his wife got in on the action as well. She is credited with inventing silk and teaching how to weave it, which created lots and lots of wealth for all of the people around her, and she's also credited with inventing the mirror. Now, whereabouts did Huang Di and his wife do this? Well, it was in the Yellow River Valley region in modern-day Hunan province. Now, what is the first mention of Huang Di? So like I said, there are no primary sources. The only primary source that we have comes from the spring and autumn period or during the Warren States period. And for those of you who do not know, that was around 2000 years later. There's no archeological evidence either. So, you know, like this isn't really history, but it is more cultural history. So this is why I want to mention it. And it's good to speculate on these things as well because the Chinese back then seemed to believe it so it would be a shame not to include these stories in our narrative today. After all, he is a cultural icon. Now, I'm going to leave Huang Di out of the narrative and move on to the next of these sage kings. His name is Shenong. And I'll say it one more time, Shenong. So who is Shenong? Well, Shenong is known as the Divine Farmer, and he was located on the Wei River, a breakaway from the Yellow River which is in today's modern Shanxi province. So when was he around? Well, I couldn't find any specific years about his birth or anything like that, but all I know is that he was around at the same time as Huang Di. And the reason why I think nobody can really locate his birth is because it seems to be more of a special occasion. So people focus on the birth itself and not when it was. So he was born with oxen-like features, and you could see this in every piece of artwork he's in, it looks like he has two horns on his head, and apparently he could start walking three days after his birth. Just three days! And at the age of three, so three years later, he was ploughing fields. What a quick learner! So what was he known for? Well, he was known for a hell of a lot. The name Shenong, like I said, translates to Divine Farmer. So guess what he was good at then? Yep, that's right, he was great at farming. He invented tools such as the hoe 
to gain larger crop yields. He also developed irrigation techniques and he's credited with domesticating oxen to plough fields as well. He also became known as the God of Fire because he could use fire to fertilise his fields and clear dense forests with fire, creating more room for humans to plant fields. Now, that doesn't seem very nice considering that, you know, loads of animals probably lived in these forests and he just burned them out. But you know, ancient mankind did do this, unfortunately. It's a sad truth, but we did. The last thing, and probably the most popular thing that Shinong is known for, is his medicine. Now this is the days before penicillin, obviously, and Shinong wanted to try and cure as many illnesses as he could using herbs. And no, not that herb, everything else that you can think of. He would also try the herbs on himself as well. What a selfless guy. He is also said, and get this, he's also said to have had see-through skin so he could see how the herb affected his blood. Ah, yeah, that sounds pretty awesome. And as well as this, he is also said to have invented tea, which he used as an antidote in case he ate the wrong herb. Then for that alone, he should definitely be remembered. I am from the British Isles. Of course I love my tea. So when you compare these two guys, you have one who is more focused on civilization and statecraft, and the other one is more focused on agriculture and the backbone of said civilization. But the two of them faced one major problem. He is known as Churyo, and I'll say it again, Churyo. Now Churyo was located in what is modern day Shandong province, just where the Yellow River flows out to sea. He is said to be a demon god and basically rampaged through everything he came across. The Han Dynasty actually depicted him as a demon with a bull's head carrying a sword, an axe and a bow and arrow on his hands and feet. He looks absolutely terrifying, so I would recommend a little google search so you can actually look at him because, yeah, he does look pretty scary. Later generations of Chinese scholars, however, just depict him as a man, like the other two in this narrative. Now Churyo had no navy, so he wanted to expand west, and right into Huang Di's doorstep, and engaged him in a number of battles, and Huang Di lost every single one. Churyo seemed to be a god of war, or maybe a god of the mists if you will, because he could call on the mists at any time, confusing his enemies then swoop in and rout them. Huang Di had absolutely no defence for this, and of course, the mist would confuse his men, it would plummet morale, and, you know, like, the enemy had a clear advantage with the mists. Now Huang Di was actually thinking that he was going to die very soon, so he fled to Shenong for aid, and Shenong accepted, and with that, the two states of Huangdi and Shenong set to war with Churyo. It is now that the tide started to turn around in this war, and it came to a head at Zhuolu in modern day Hubei province, basically not far from Beijing. And with this, Huangdi had a couple of new inventions up his sleeve. For one, it was the first time battle drums were ever used in a battle, so that scared Churyo's army. And the second was a primitive compass that allowed his men to stay the course so he could fight the enemies knowing that they were heading in the right direction, which surprised Churyo's army. Now the result of this was a huge victory for Huang Di, and all of the tribal leaders that fought Churyo alongside him hailed him as their emperor. While Shinong? Well, he pretty much got sidelined. So naturally, after the war was done and dusted, and everyone went home, Shenong started a rebellion. And it's a shame because Shenong's rebellion was in vain. By this time, Huang Di was too powerful, he had too many allies, and Shenong was isolated. So it was a case of when, and not if, he would be defeated. But surprisingly, after Shenong was captured, he was actually allowed to live as long as he continued his work 
and ironically, it is that kind of work that killed him. So the story goes that Shunon was trying herbs, as he usually did, and this one turned out to be a very poisonous one indeed, and it killed him before he could drink his anecdotal tea. So yeah, sad times. I'm sorry, Shunon. Huang Di, on the other hand, dominated the entire Yellow River Valley, from Shandong province in the east to Shanxi province in the west. The Han culture was born with him, and he is known as the forefather of Han culture, hence why he is held up in such high prestige today. It is said that when he did die, a dragon came down from the heavens and swept him up into the sky. Now I know, ancient astronaut theorists will be screaming it was an alien spaceship, and who knows, maybe they are right, and Huang Di was in fact an alien, because I mean, he does sound like quite an incredible character for humans to produce. But, you know, I will let you guys decide on that one. Now that is a wrap for this week's episode. And next week, we are going to look at the last of the five sage kings. They were known as Yao, Shun, and Yu. So I'll say their names again. Yao, Shun, and Yu, and what they achieved. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed this episode, and I will see you next time on the Chronicler Podcast channel. Thanks for listening.